Welcome to the Community of Practice for Teaching and Learning podcast series. I'm Dr. Victoria Chen, and join me as we dive into stories from our teaching and learning community. Today, we will be talking about creativity and innovation. And joining me in the studio is Dr. Patrice Esten, who is the Associate Dean in the Department of English at Humber College. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we met through Melanie, our Vice Provost of at University of Guelph Humber, and had a brief conversation about how you bring creativity into your teaching and ways we can inspire others to do the same. We did. That was a really fun conversation, honestly. <laughs> I love talking about creativity because it's so unexpected for someone like me to be talking about creativity and how we bring it into our practice in post-secondary education, whether we're teaching or administrators. I think it's uh, in, an important quality and, and skill set to bring to what we do every day, especially in the world we're living in, where things are changing so quickly. What's required of us now to thrive is the ability to innovate and create and come up with new functioning, meaningful things. And if we lack that capacity, then we fall behind. The, the good thing is we can continue to practice and learn how to do these things. And I think that's a big misconception people have about creativity in our, in our world. Absolutely. So we're going to take a bit of a step back just when you just said um, this isn't something people would expect from you. So if you want to just tell us a bit about yourself, how you got to um, Humber College and how creativity has like impacted you. Well, that is a story that I will try to be brief with. I am actually trained as an industrial organizational psychologist. For those of you who don't know what that is, that is basically psychology of the workplace. And so my uh, study and practice is focused on helping people function more effectively in their work environments. Everything from work and uh, motivation to succession planning to group dynamics. That's the space I was trained in. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we go back, we even before then, as a child, I was not the child you would expect. I was the child who my mother brought to sign them up for dance class, who left not being signed up for dance class, but having their younger sister be signed <laughs> up for dance class because I was rhythmically challenged and coordinationally challenged. And it was just not, everyone could see that was not a place for me. <laughs> and thank goodness. I was the child who my mom would redraw any assignment for my homework oh. that required drawing <laughs> because I was so so bad. I was atrocious at it. I just was not good in these spaces, you know, and given I was rhythmically challenged, piano lessons, piano teacher was happy to see the back of me, <laughs> also <laughs> failed <laughs> there. So, you know, when you look at me and, and you know, th th those early days, there's nothing that says creative. And as I continued in on to post-secondary I was, you know, I studied psychology and so social sciences, that's mm -hmm. not what people think. I am a type A personality, I'm organized, I'm structured. There's nothing there that says creativity. And that's where I say, you know, people sometimes, when we think of creativity, we think so much of the outside of the box thinkers that don't, we don't realize that there's a lot of creativity that's required to actually navigate and innovate inside the box when you have restraints and rules that mm -hmm. govern what you do every day. And that was the place in which I thrived. And I didn't real, realize that for the longest time that I actually was creating and coming up with fantastic, wonderful ideas that were impactful. I just thought, well, this is what one does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I started, I was just coincidentally introduced to some creativity practitioners who started mm -hmm. talking about, well, creativity is all about new and, in, uh, you know, new and impactful, new and valuable. And that's where you get innovation. And when you're able to take something and really bring value to the world, it's about combining things that you don't think would normally exist in the space and actually bringing something to the market that you never thought before. And it's funny because we live in a world where these things happen all the time and we don't recognize it. We walk around with smartphones in our pockets every day. But if I think back to my grandparents' generation or the, you know, the 70s, early 80s, 
if you said to our grandparents, yeah, there's going to be a time when your cell phone is also going to be a video camera. <laughs> you can watch TV on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can pay for stuff mm-hmm. with it. They would have thought that you were living in another <laughs> universe. Mm-hmm. But yet we accept it. But when we were asked to practice it, mm-hmm. we doubt our own capabilities to actually do so. And we think it's something that's unique and special. And so I had the opportunity to start looking at it from a theoretical perspective and then practicing it. And so I became a creativity trainer. Mm-hmm. I became a facilitator for creative thinking and creative problem solving. I've explored different creative thinking methodologies. You know, so I've looked at the work from the D school. I've looked at foresight, and I've looked at so many different methodologies. The work of Chick Sent Me High mm-hmm. and the state of flow, and so many other researchers and what they do in this space. And I've concluded that creativity is a learned skill, like. Everything else, you know, you can have someone who has the physical capability to be a good athlete, but if they don't train, if they don't practice, they won't achieve their full potential as an Mm -hmm. athlete. And it's the same thing with creativity. The more we practice it, the more we exercise it, the stronger we get at it. And that's where it becomes important in post-secondary, not just for our faculty and staff to be doing it, but empowering our students to do it because it's a skill they're going to need when they walk out of our physical or virtual doors. Mm -hmm. When they finally get that credential and they go into their workplaces, you know, employers today are looking for creative thinkers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can pull the research from the National Association of Colleges and Employers that the U.S. does every year. You can pull the research from the Canadian Board of Innovation. You can look at these spaces and you will see, the Conference Canada, sorry, Mm -hmm. you can see that they're asking for these skills. Mm -hmm. When you look at them, they're always in the top 10 skills of Mm -hmm. what are employers looking for. Absolutely. I love how you now think about creativity in such a broad sense, because I think a lot of faculties might say creativity is owned by the arts and you don't really see it in other disciplines. But like you said, when you're looking for a job, creativity is a very top skill. So shouldn't every discipline be somehow talking about this? Well, I think most disciplines implicitly are creative. Mm -hmm. I I just don't think that we recognize Mm -hmm the creativity within our discipline. I mean, think about chemistry. A lot of times we go in and we look up atoms and molecules and we, you know, and we are in our chemistry labs talking about these various things. You know, we talk about acids and bases in the chemistry lab. Well, what happens if we combine that with with, with food? All of a sudden, it's a whole different Mm -hmm. world. And and those people who work with food chemistry, they can tell you all of these exciting things that are happening from applying a certain, you know, acidic juice from a particular fruit to something else. And now you get this fantastic color Mm -hmm. change. If you talk to bartenders, they'll tell you organic organic chemistry is at work in what they do. And you Mm -hmm. see these, you know, we get these beautifully colored beverages. Yes. And we don't recognize that that is the creativity within Mm the science that's at play here where people are able to take that foundational knowledge. You can't break the rules until you know the rules, Mm -hmm. right? So we're able to take that foundational knowledge we have about these chemicals And use them to do something that's new, that adds value to the world, that adds wow and pop and sizzle Mm -hmm. to our world. And we don't recognize that. And so, you know, we talk about things like economics and, you know, demand and supply in microeconomics. Well, there's creativity in that space, too. And I, I think it's sometimes we get so bogged down by the theory and the principles that we lose track of the creative aspects Mm -hmm. of our fields. Absolutely. So right now, uh, we're recording this kind of near the end of a semester, and we were just chatting in the hallway about exams. And so I don't think anyone would really say put creativity in exams in the same sentence, (laughs) but you had talked about this. And um, the example was uh, international students that you had that were talking during an exam and just tell us that story. Yeah, You know, I, you know, I taught for 18 years. And so before I moved into administration, I was at the post-secondary level for 18 years. And I had the opportunity to watch my classroom evolve in terms of diversity. And one semester, by their own sharing, I realized I had a class of 90% international students. 
most from the same region of the same mm-hmm. country. And, you know, the class progressed as normal. We got to our first test. And all of a sudden in my classroom, there was just this steady hum. And like most faculty members, you try to invigilate your test. So you go from table to table Mm -hmm. and the table I would be standing by would be quiet. And then the hum would be (laughs) elsewhere and back and forth, back and forth. And not only was a steady hum of conversation, it was also conversation that was not in English. So mm-hmm. I had, and, 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 and mm-hmm. it wasn't in a language I spoke, so I had no clue what, or, what the students were saying. Mm-hmm. The gut instincts, right, the first place we go as faculty members oftentimes when something like this happens is, oh, my Lord, my, te- my students are, te- are cheating. Mm-hmm. And now I'm going to have to fill out all of these academic integrity <laughs> yes, paperwork. I'm exactly going to have to <laughs> figure out how we're going to navigate this. And I had that, that, that thought for a second, and then I went, you know what? Maybe I need to stop mm-hmm. and rethink this whole situation. And so, yeah, I collected the test, and I grouped them by table, and I looked at them, and I graded them. And honestly, the class did not perform particularly well. Mm-hmm. But I really thought about, what am I doing? What do I know here? And I questioned everything. And I, I'm like, well, what do I know about these students? Mm-hmm. Well, we've been doing in-class activities all semester up to this test. They mm-hmm. love working together. I knew that. They knew that. Mm-hmm. And clearly they were showing me this in this test. Okay, I know they like working together. Okay. What do I n- know about what I need to do? Well, I need to assess their learning in some way to provide a grade at the end of the semester. Okay. Mm-hmm. What do I know about what happened in my last assessment? Well, that didn't quite work. There was a lot of mm-hmm. talking. I don't know what they're talking about. It could, could have been one friend translating for another. Mm-hmm. It could have been cheating. I don't know. Well, is there a way to take what they love and what I need to do and put it together? Like, can I make a group test? Is there a way to do this? And at first I thought I was crazy. <laughs> but because I am a trained researcher, I have not abandoned my roots for those of you who think <laughs> I've gone crazy. No, no. I am a trained researcher and I also have a certificate in post-secondary pedagogy. I went digging. I'm like, mm-hmm. somebody out here, I can't be the first person to have wondered, mm-hmm. can my students be assessed in a group setting and each person be able to demonstrate their learning in the space and their skill acquisition. So I went digging into the research and I started finding articles. Oh, there are ways to do group assessments, but nothing I found demonstrated what I needed for Mm. my setting. What it did was it said, okay, you can do this. Mm -hmm. Students can choose their own groups or you can make the groups. They perform equally well. It's reliable. It's valid. For those of you who speak scientific (laughs) speak, it means they perform consistently. It tests what it needs to test. And so... I went, well, how do I build this? If what they've shown me in the research doesn't work for me, what do I do? So trial and error, I started playing around with it. I went, well, what happens if I just tell the students, pick your own group, give them a test packet and say, go. I did. And then I realized, well, some students are going to come in less prepared than others. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Well, what happens if I give them a prep sheet ahead of time? And part of that's the grade. You come in with your prep sheet and then and we use, we leverage what's on that prep sheet to actually answer the test questions. And all of a sudden, Eureka, I'd hit on something. But what really surprised me was that not only was that healthy buzz leveraged, people would walk by my class and I'd wave or step out and talk to them. I'm like, my students are doing a test. And they would be like, what? They're all in there talking. I'm like, yes, they're supposed to. That's Mm -hmm. the whole point. But the best part was students started walking out of class saying, I understood that concept that much better Mm -hmm. now. And the pressure came off of the strong, the one or two strong students to know everything and tell their peers because each person had to come in with their prep sheet Mm -hmm. and each person's contribution was needed for the group test. So each and each student got an individual grade because it was your prep Mm -hmm. sheet score plus your group score. So I wasn't really grading more papers. It was Mm the same level of grading. It didn't create more time for me, but what it did was allow me to engage my students in the place where they thrived and they were happiest, Mm -hmm. but it also helped me see how they were learning and navigating with the materials because you couldn't go into the group and hide behind the strongest student. Mm -hmm. 
I could still see <laughs> yeah. if you were. And if you didn't come in with their prep sheet, it evolved. It conti- I continued to iterate it. So students would submit their prep sheet on Blackboard ahead of time mm. so that when they came into class, the, oh, no, I forgot to print my prep sheet mm-hmm. or I didn't have money to print my prep sheet or any of those things that might have prevented them from printing their prep sheets, I could say, no problem, I can print it for you. And I would mm-hmm. hit print, walk down the hall, come back. You know, the students had autonomy to, autonomy to talk about who is in your group. If someone comes in late, are you willing mm-hmm. to accept a, a late group mm-hmm. member? And what I found, even with my students with accommodations, the first test, they would go to the testing mm-hmm. center and they'd come back and hear mm-hmm. about how it happened in the class and ask to, to test in the class. And so even that shifted the dynamic for us. And I will say one more last mm-hmm. one thing because people ask me about that. How did you navigate those students mm-hmm. with accommodations? What did you yeah. do? Well, it was easy. I had all the prep sheets anyway. Mm-hmm. They'd submitted them onto Blackboard. So I stripped identifying materials, mm-hmm. names off of it. And so I could create a packet that said, here you go. You have your prep sheet here. <laughs> here are two mm-hmm. more from these people are your teammates. Use oh. this information to answer your yeah. test. So they were not disadvantaged in mm. any way in terms of not having prep sheets. They yeah. had the prep sheets. They just didn't have the conversation. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them recognized that they missed that conversation, mm-hmm. wanted it. And every single time it happened, my test two, everyone was in the mm-hmm. class testing with me. That's amazing. Uh, can you talk about like the students' reactions like after? Oh, they exams? loved it. They, you know, they talked about, oh, this was so much fun. I, I, mm-hmm. Very rarely do I hear students say a test was fun, but yeah. they would. They would walk out and say, this was fun. I learned more about this than I, I did, or I didn't understand that concept in class, but I get it now. Mm-hmm. Because and, and sometimes, you know, as faculty members, we need, and educators, we need to recognize that even the best communicator mm-hmm. might not always land. And students can and still do learn a lot from their peers. And there's nothing wrong with a peer re-explaining something and a student getting it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was a lot of positive feedback. And that's something on course reviews that students would talk about over and over Mm -hmm. was, you know, this ability to test. And it also increased in-class attendance because students realized we were leveraging the things we were doing in class and the activities Mm -hmm. that were happening in class for individual prep sheets that would then come back on into the test. It also gave me that opportunity to test their ability to apply Mm -hmm. their knowledge as opposed to what can you recall? Because there's different types of tests, right? right. And these multiple choice bubbling Mm -hmm. forms oftentimes are testing Mm -hmm. recall as opposed to application. But I had the flexibility now to Mm -hmm. focus on can you take this information and use it in a new setting? Mm -hmm. Again, their own creativity. How do you what do you do when it's new? Can you transfer mm-hmm. this knowledge and apply it elsewhere? Yeah. And I think it also removed a lot of the stress. It did. So that they can just like focus on performing. Exactly. It wasn't about I have to m- remember everything. Yes. It's not about I have to study through all mm-hmm. of these. It's OK. I went through my notes. I have my individual prep sheet. I used my notes to get to my prep sheet. All I need to focus on now is this information on this prep sheet with 10 questions and answers. That's yeah. all I have to do. It's amazing. Uh, So building off of that, let's talk about peer feedback and how you've helped to really peer feedback isn't always accurate. We were talking about sometimes students are harder on themselves. Sometimes they just give they don't know how to give feedback. And how have you revamped peer feedback in your classroom? Well, aren't we all a little bit cautious about giving feedback? (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us are, you know, some of us do come from cultures where we're straight Mm -hmm. shooters and we Mm -hmm. say what's on our mind. And in those cultures, it's completely appropriate and acceptable. And others come from cultures that are less direct. Mm -hmm. And we don't say what we're thinking. And it's intuited Mm -hmm. if you understand that culture, what's meant. And so... When we get into our classroom with diverse, that are so diverse, we have people who will give feedback comfortably and others who mm-hmm. won't. And then we have people who are also concerned about the relationships that they have to maintain. So it's a level of, mm-hmm. well, how honest is this feedback? Yeah. We have people who aren't sure how much or how little to mm-hmm. say. And so we find these places when we ask students to give feedback to their peers that it, you know, where they say, oh, they were really good and everybody gets tens across the board. <laughs> and you, or you have the people who are really harsh and it's, mm. it's, it's threes across the board. And, you know, you'll have the few in the middle because they're not really sure where, which yeah. way to go. But you really, you know, everything the research says about students giving feedback to each other without coaching and guidance mm-hmm. says it's not the best way. And so many times we have people 
oh, your grade will be based on your peer feedback. And I go, and that makes mm. me personally cringe a little bit because I recognize that grade might not reflect the student's true performance. And so, mm. you know, one of the things I did with my students is that we talked about how do we give feedback? Let's talk about the strengths. When we talk about areas of improvement, mm -hmm. you know, you know, instead of saying you could have done better here, mm -hmm. How about we ask it in a constructive question, you know, how might we connect mm. the, the members of our team better instead of no one in your team talks? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what are, or what are some strategies we could use to help mm -hmm. our team connect on a higher level? And then I said to my students, I'm not grading you based on what you said about Victoria's work, mm -hmm. about, you know, Patrice's work. I am based, I'm grading you based on. I'm not grading you, but based on what Victoria or Patrice says to you, I am grading you based on your feedback, mm -hmm. the quality of the feedback you gave to other students. So your feedback grade is your work being graded, not someone else's, what they say about it. Mm -hmm. the, and what happened is students became more invested mm -hmm. in thinking through their feedback because they were less concerned about maintaining these relationships and they had the skills to actually effectively give feedback. And they also really thought about, okay, I, I don't need to worry about, because that's the thing. If I'm worrying about, well, well, if you give me a 10, I give you a 10, mm -hmm. then everybody gets a 10. Yeah. But if I'm no longer worried about that, mm -hmm. I can actually be more forthcoming. And that's, again, mm -hmm. another transferable skill that they take from our classrooms into the world. Mm -hmm. Because we do. We find ourselves with colleagues and teams where we have to give feedback, yes. whether, uh, whether formally or mm -hmm. informally, and we're not sure how to do it. And so the more we help our students think differently, this is really about rethinking what we do in our mm -hmm. classroom spaces, in our assessments. It's really about questioning how we're doing things now and what our students need in any given moment. That's really what creativity is about, is about mm -hmm. bringing the skill sets we have and then evolving them, doing something new with them, flexing them, bending yes. them to see what happens. And sometimes mm -hmm. we fail. I, yeah. I, sometimes I fail mm -hmm. epically with trying something new in my class. But the point of doing that, it also humanizes us as faculty members and mm -hmm. as leaders. You know, our students, see, you know, they're also concerned about their failures. They're also concerned about their mistakes. In fact, I'm sure most of us have had conversations with a student who wasn't as successful as they'd hoped to be. Mm -hmm. And we say to them, you're going to be fine. You can learn from yeah. this. You can grow from that. But we forget to apply our own advice. That's right. And we forget to sometimes show our students that, you know, the failures and the mistakes, most of them, not all, some mm -hmm. of them are, are quite bad, but most of them <laughs> <laughs> won't, won't be that detrimental. Yes. You know, one of the things I did with my students, because, you know, with creativity comes risk taking and with risk taking comes failure. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I did with my students once I started documenting my mistakes and failures. Oh. So I went into mm -hmm. a lecture and I didn't tell them what I was doing, but I just had this little tally on the board. And mm -hmm. every time I tripped up on a word, mm -hmm. whether I, you know, I used bad grammar, <laughs> I mispronounced a word, you know, I called a student accidentally by the wrong name, mm -hmm. whatever little mistake, there was a typo on my slide. I just started tallying them. Mm -hmm. And about 45 minutes into the class, I had this hefty tally <laughs> of mistakes on the board. And I said to my students, because they didn't know what the tally mm -hmm. was. They just saw me tallying as I went. I said, do you know what this, 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 this tally is for? And they're like, no, we don't know. You've just been tallying. Mm -hmm. I'm like, suppose I told you those were all the mistakes I've made in the last 45 minutes. Who, who noticed all of those mistakes that mm -hmm. I made? Nobody. Yeah. Nobody m m paid attention that I'd made that many mistakes mm -hmm. in such a short period of time because most of those mistakes were not impactful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't make a difference, but what they did was humanize us. Yes. And we learn from our mistakes. We get better and stronger. We think differently because we make mistakes. And sometimes we forget about that. We get mm -hmm. so bogged down by the failure that we forget there's an opportunity for learning and growth and creativity mm -hmm and doing things differently and actually saving the baby while we get rid of the bathwater. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I'm just thinking about how you're saying humanizing it and how students often when they're doing their presentations, they're so scared because they think like they have to be perfect. But as instructors, like we're up there every class. And if we just show them like we can make mistakes, it's not to say someone should just show up and not know what they're doing. Yes. But I mean, Sometimes it's okay to show, just be like, oh, yeah, I, 
I forgot how to use Zoom or I forgot how to click this thing. Exactly. You know, and um, you've talked a lot about like bringing down barriers. And a lot of times they might be things institutions set up, but also it could be things that we built up ourselves yes. and we're too stubborn to take it down, mm -hmm. resistant. If you ask us why we put those barriers up, like we probably can't even explain why. We don't even know the barriers are there. No. <laughs> and They've been there so long, we don't see them anymore. Absolutely. And so this brings, um, so I was teaching a group of adult learners on digital literacy in eCampus Ontario recently. And we have one activity where we're addressing common blind spot misconceptions. <laughs> and so one student told me that there's a common misconception of office hours and that students thought office hours meant this is a time you're working in the office, so don't bother me. So no one ever shows up at the office hours. <laughs> but this it's a barrier to the yeah. students because no one came. And once they explain what it was, yes. all these students are like, oh, so that's time for us to come yes. and ask questions. Uh, so what are some common like arbitrary barriers that you have seen? Maybe you've uh, put up and you've broken down. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> this is how we've always done things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's worked efficiently for me for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, these are a lot of things that come, you know, with a long time in a career. I fall and pray to it, too. Human beings by nature, we, we become cognitive misers, especially as we get older. And, and cognitive misers just means we tend to be efficient. And the more experience mm, we have yeah. with life and the world, we figure out the shortcuts that help us make decisions mm. very quickly. And in the process of figuring out those shortcuts, we stop kind of thinking through a lot of the details of things. So we get into a routine and this is how mm -hmm. I've always done it and this is how it's yeah. worked. Therefore, I can iterate a little bit and my iteration is changing the colors on my slides. Mm -hmm. Oh, a AODA is coming in, so let me change mm -hmm. the font to make it AODA mm -hmm. compliant. And so we do these small iterations, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily challenge ourselves mm -hmm. to think beyond or go, who is in my classroom now? 15 years ago, mm -hmm, these yeah. persons were in my classroom and this worked really well mm -hmm. for them. But how have they changed and how have I stagnated mm -hmm. <laughs> and what needs to happen here? You know, we have to recognize that even five years ago, our students today are different from students mm -hmm. in 20, fall, yeah. fall 2019, yeah. the pre-pandemic era. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're different. They have they've changed. We've been impacted by the mm -hmm. pandemic. We are different in our own spaces. And so it really comes to that place of it's not the knowledge base that is our challenge. It's what we do next with that knowledge mm -hmm. base. And sometimes we are fearful of the risk. Yeah. Well, what if I do that? My dean, my 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 mm -hmm. my students might not like it. They might yeah. complain yes. that I am not doing things the way they expect. Because students come to class with expectations too. Mm -hmm. If a faculty member walks in without PowerPoint today and lectures for three hours without mm -hmm. their PowerPoint slides, students might be uncomfortable mm -hmm. because we have established a system where PowerPoint is the norm for most classes and, you know, the old school hand taking notes, mm -hmm. not, not the norm. And there's nothing wrong with PowerPoint or no PowerPoint. My point is we have to evolve with the world. Mm -hmm. We have to evolve with the world. And so, you know, Monopoly money might become a part of that macroeconomics class to talk about GDP, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, a faculty member might revamp their microeconomics class to include You'd, you know, to put students in groups where there are different members of a society where some are shopkeepers and some are, are, are customers and to, to explain demand and supply. Mm -hmm. It's not just about childhood, what we do in our child, because I know mm -hmm. we have a, a uh, an early childhood uh, program here. It's not about just that, because that's yeah. the thing. What's interesting about us as human beings, when we were kids, we played, we had fun, we took risks. We made things up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we learned a lot in that. We fell down. We got mm -hmm. up. <laughs> we had mm -hmm. skin, knees, and <laughs> broken mm -hmm. arms. And we learned a lot in that process. And somewhere along the line in our system, we get older and we told, you don't play anymore. You don't have yeah. fun anymore. Learning is not fun. Mm -hmm. Why? Why shouldn't learning be fun? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why shouldn't we? go into our classrooms and say, you know what, today we're going to do things differently. Today, 
I'm, we're not even going to be in the classroom. Grab your coats. Let's go. We're going on a field mm-hmm. trip. And we're going to look at these various things all over campus. And when we get back, we're going to have a, you know, bring your camera so we can talk about lighting and mm-hmm. how we capture lighting for, for a video shoot when we're in these different spaces. Mm-hmm. And let's not go to the conventional spaces where people expect to see us. Mm-hmm. Let's not just let's not go to the Arboretum because they expect us there. Mm-hmm. You know, how about we going the random stairwell, <laughs> <laughs> you know, of the parking garage to talk about, you know, what lighting is going to be like mm-hmm. in this space and how do we manage the boom and all the mm-hmm. production equipment we bring when we're in a tight spot mm-hmm. <laughs> to navigate and bring this to life. And we think, oh, that's a lot of work. But what's interesting is the students come back, they're laughing and smiling, but they've also learned. Yeah. And for me, if I can do three hours and my students leave out, leave smiling and laughing and they remember, mm-hmm. that's been a successful day if I've done it differently, doing it differently with a purpose. If we want to think about how to create in post-secondary, doing things differently with a purpose, making it effective. It's not just about doing something wild and funny just for doing something wild and funny. Mm-hmm. It's not about just stepping out of the box and creating for yeah. the sake of creating. That's a, that's part of it, too. But in the space, it has to have an impact. It has to have a value add mm-hmm. to what we do. And when we start changing what we do in our space, others look to us. You know, I remember when early MOOCs came out and so many people mm-hmm. were thinking, I don't want to do a MOOC. I'm not going to do a MOOC. And then all of a sudden, Second Life came out. And I know some some of our students won't remember Second Life, and some of our faculty members probably didn't even know mm-hmm. Second Life existed. <laughs> but it was this program with avatars online, and yeah. everyone jumped into Second Life, and Harvard had had lecture theaters there, and several mm-hmm. universities were there for a while with their MOOCs. So MOOCs were not just this online classroom. Mm-hmm. It was an online classroom in a virtual world. Yeah. <laughs> and it brought us to a different space. You know, we think about math. Why not gamify it? Why not try to figure out how we can create a a game out of some subject matter that some of our students cringe when they think, oh, do I have to take that math class? Mm -hmm. Do I, you know, all I have to do is pass. All I have to do is pass. Wouldn't it be lovely to get some of those students who walk in feeling apprehensive and scared thinking all I have to do is pass to walk out and think I never thought that class would be so much fun. And I learned so much and I'm feeling so much more confident in my mathematical abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, why not? Why not? (laughs) So we're going to go to our last question. And so going back to the eCampus course I was teaching, one of the activities was uh, for students to come up with a teaching metaphor. And one of my learners came up with how taking a course should be like taking a vacation. And that really made me think of you and like this (laughs) podcast. And really, you're going on this journey that hopefully for the better, sometimes you don't have a great experience, but you should be changed in some way after this course, after this vacation. Um, So really, what final advice do you have for our faculty, staff, students in fostering a culture of creativity and teaching and learning? Well, to bring you back to the vacation metaphor, when we're going on vacation, we're packing for vacation, at least when I pack for vacation, I'll speak for myself. (laughs) I am typically the person who thinks of forecast all the things I could possibly need and I pack everything I could possibly need. So, you know, I have this big bag of there's band-aids and painkillers and, you know, anti-nausea meds, even though I don't get motion sick, but just in case somebody I'm traveling does, you know, and my EpiPen and all these things I need and I have all the clothes and I've organized it all. But then I get to vacation and I go in relax mode. And I think That's a great metaphor for creativity. Creativity doesn't mean ignoring your foundational principles Mm -hmm. from your field or your discipline. No, when we look at the people who have thrived creatively in our world, the people who have innovative, you know, when we look at the Googles and 3Ms and the organizations, you know, the Steve Jobs of the world, when we are looking at those persons, We're seeing people who have profound, deep disciplinary knowledge and understanding of their space. They don't know everything. And that's the other thing. They understand what they don't know Mm -hmm. along with what they know. But then they're open to new experiences and thinking differently. And so if I were to speak to a faculty member today or have a conversation and say, you know what, be open. Be open to trying new things. 
learn from your mistakes. Don't just chalk everything up to, oh, that was a full out failure. We tried that before it didn't work. Well, why mm-hmm. did it fail? Question your assumptions. If I'd assumed that my students were all cheaters, mm-hmm. I would not have developed this methodology of testing that really changed the way my students learned and engaged with our material. So question your assumptions. Why am I believing the things I'm believing? Give yourself permission to dream even the impossible. You know, we, we don't even realize we're living in times where the impossible is possible. We're living in a time of something like laparoscopic surgery. Cameras can go into the mm-hmm. body. And we don't recognize that at one point that was an impossible mm-hmm. thought. So give yourself the opportunity to imagine, imagine the possible. If you think, you know what? I would love to have class in the parking garage. Well, why can't you? Mm-hmm. Why can't your students show up in their vehicles? Yeah. And we saw that in COVID. Mm-hmm. A lot of religious institutions had their services in parking mm-hmm. lots. And nobody ever thought that was going to be a thing, but yeah. it became a thing, mm-hmm. right? So why not? Ask yourself, well, why can't I do that? What's the thing? What's stopping you? What is the thing stopping you from trying that new thing, from thinking differently in this space? And challenge your own thinking because it's easy for us to fall back on those schemas and those automatic things that help us make decisions really quickly. But when we become intentional about what we're doing, that's when we give creativity that room to grow, Mm -hmm. when we give ourselves the opportunity to try things differently. And if you're scared to take a risk, start with small ones. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you don't have to hit it out of the park Mm -hmm. the first day. Just try to hit the ball, (laughs) hit the the ball, get on first base. For those of you who play, play, (laughs) play um, baseball, for those of you who don't hit the ball and make a run or two, if you play cricket, (laughs) right? You don't have to worry about how far you hit it the first time. Just try different things, you know, Go in today and, and, and do your lecture notes differently. Instead of using a PowerPoint, try an infographic for your lecture mm-hmm. notes and see how that works. Start small and try that. And if it doesn't work, fix it. <laughs> then you mm-hmm. work yourself up to a place where you feel comfortable taking risks. But if you don't give yourself permission, mm-hmm. first, permission in, in generating ideas, our way of generating ideas We generate an idea. We think if it's good or bad. If it's bad, it goes in the trash. If we think it's kind of good, it stays. And we never stop to think that what's the potential of that bad idea? Mm -hmm. We never stop to think that maybe that bad idea might actually have some value in this space. I will share the story with you because it's it's painfully embarrassing, but also makes my point. (laughs) When I was a brand new faculty member, I had I was a part of a committee my first semester in my full-time faculty role. And this committee had two faculty members, including me. It had associate deans, it had deans, and it had some vice presidents. So I was low person on the pecking pole, (laughs) right? And we were generating ideas for a particular challenge we were facing. And, you know... I kind of leaned into this idea of, you know, let's just throw everything out there and see what sticks. And for some unknown reason, I said, tar and feather them. It's a very Mm -hmm. cruel form of punishment for those of you who don't know. And and imagine you say that in front of your boss, your boss's boss, your boss's (laughs) boss's boss. (laughs) And you are just been hired in a job. And as soon as that came out of my mouth, I thought, oh, my Lord they are going to want me out of this space. I said nothing more for the rest of this conversation (laughs) because I just realized what I'd said. Everything continued. We took a break and I was talking to the other faculty member like, I'm so embarrassed. I can't believe I said that. Mm -hmm. People, what are people thinking about me? Mm -hmm. And I got caught up in the judgments. Well, it was funny because we came back, we, we looked at the ideas and it was my tar and feather idea that actually brought us to the solution. This thing that I was so wholly mm-hmm. embarrassed by from an academic standpoint, this thing that I thought made me look like a terrible person and even worse academic <laughs> was the thing that really made us pause and go, wait, we've been focusing on how to stop a certain type of behavior. Why aren't we focused on how to promote and encourage the behavior we want to see? Mm-hmm. And it completely changed your thinking about what we were doing. 
And so, you know, when I now when I generate ideas, I let every idea fly up there, even if I think, you know, mm. my gut feeling is that sucks. It goes up there <laughs> anyway, because maybe there's something mm. in there that I have missed. But if I ball it up and throw it in the trash, I never mm. even get that opportunity to take that second mm. moment to go. Is there potential there? Mm. And, you know, when we evaluate our ideas, when we give ourselves a chance to just get them all out there, we have time to give ourselves time to think about all the good not so good parts about our ideas and also improve them. So where we're going, okay, what's great about this? Oh, what are my problems? Oh, I can fix that. Oh, I can fix that. All of a sudden we realize that some of the things that we thought were bad about the ideas are fixable and we can actually implement it. Oh, we don't have money for that. Well, what if we get a donor? <laughs> mm -hmm. We don't have time for that. Okay, what if we do less time over here to create time? All of a sudden, we start to see the possibility in these ideas that otherwise wouldn't make it to the table. So, and my, you know, and for those who are kind of thinking, well, what do I read? How do I do this? There's a lot of places to read. There are lots of uh, PD sessions. There's the D School. The uh, Buffalo State has a program. But you know, you might just start simple. Adam Grant talks about thinking differently and he doesn't call it creativity. He just says, think differently, mm. questions your assumptions, ask these different questions. And maybe we start there with one book, book or audio book, whatever your fancy is. <laughs> and, and, and you just give yourself, how do I think about this differently? What do I do differently today? What small thing can I do differently in my classroom? You know, what happens if I pair my students up to do a test together? What, how does that work? Experiment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. give yourself the freedom to try it and also give yourself the freedom and the grace that if it doesn't succeed to learn from it i think if you're looking for a sign to start being creative this podcast really is it <laughs> and thank you so much patrice for spending the afternoon with us and telling us all these amazing stories. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here and I could talk more about this. You know, it's so much fun playing around in this space. And it gives me freedom too, right? <laughs> amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Be sure to fill out our survey to share your thoughts on our podcast. Until next time. <laughs>